Welcome everybody to our first Digital Therapeutics webinar. This is the first of a six part series. So very excited to be launching this event with Ms. Kara and the Northeast Delta Human Service Authority. Uh, so this is session one is the introduction to Digital Therapeutics. Our speaker is Dr. Riso Weisberg. It is going to be one hour today. It is brought to you by the Louisiana Department of Health, Office of Behavioral Health, Northeast Delta Human Services Authority, and Foundation for Wellness. And this session is accredited for one hour for ADRA, AMA, PRA, Category 1 credits, LPCs, and Social Worker General, CEUs. As always, full participation of the presentation is required to receive credit. We monitor throughout the session. In one week, you'll receive an email from Foundation for Wellness with instructions on how to claim your credits and access your certificates. If you dialed in by phone, so those people that are using their phone as an audio, not using uh, Zoom on their phone, so if you're just dialed in, please email info at Foundation for Wellness. And in that email, please include your first and last name and the phone number you dialed in with to receive credit for this event. Um, like I said, this is the first of a six part series. Our next one, session two will be on April 17th. So for to register for this upcoming event, as well as the following, please visit foundationforwellness.com slash DTX. You can also email info at foundationforwellness.com for any for any other questions regarding the upcoming events. Um, financial disclosures, the planning committee does not have anything to disclose. Dr. Reesberg will be disclosing her financial disclosures in her presentation. Uh, I would like to let everyone know that the Q&A feature will be enabled. Please uh, type in any questions in the Q&A feature. We'll be getting to that at the end of the presentation. We have allotted a few minutes at the end of the presentation to answer all your questions. Um, the chat feature will be available as well, but if you have any questions for our speaker, please use the Q&A feature. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit of bio, then I'm going to turn over the floor to Dr. Risa. Dr. Risa Weisberg is the Chief Clinical Officer at Real Life Care, a digital therapeutics company focused on enhancing access to effective cognitive behavioral interventions. She supervises clinical content and research strategy while also holding positions as a professor of psychiatry at Boston University School of Medicine and an adjunct professor of family medicine at Brown University. Dr. Weisberg is recognized as an expert in cognitive behavioral therapy and she has held leadership roles in prominent professional organizations. Her mission is to improve the accessibility of evidence-based behavioral health treatment with nearly two decades of consistent funding from organizations like National Institutes of Health She's a prolific researcher specializing in scalable interventions for common mental health and behavioral health issues. Dr. Weisberg resides outside of Boston with her husband's two daughters and a somewhat spoiled Portuguese water dog. And I would like to bring everyone's attention to the somewhat spoiled Portuguese water dog uh, laying on the couch right behind her. Okay, Dr. Risa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, he's making quite a cameo impression right now. Um, very nice to uh, meet you all. I'm going to share my slide deck um, and we'll get started. So um, as mentioned, I'll be speaking today about um, really an introduction to the series and an introduction to digital therapeutics. Um, so this is really intended as a general overview um, on the field. Um, Ashley just mentioned uh, my bio and my disclosures. So I do disclose that I am currently a full-time employee and the chief clinical officer at Realized Care and also um, hold stock options there as well. And we are a digital therapeutics company ourselves. So um, some of what I'm talking about, there is clearly um, that to disclose. And then I also have academic affiliations at Boston University and Brown University. I'm a clinical psychologist um, by training and spent most of my career in these academic medical settings uh, before coming over to industry and about two years ago, really because at that time, it started to feel like the best way to fulfill what I've always been passionate about. And sounds like most of you are as well, which is how do we increase access to the treatments we already have and know that work well. So, um, 
overview today, I want to talk a little bit about just what digital therapeutics are, a definition of that, a little bit about how they're regulated, mostly because that's very key to the definition of what makes something a digital therapeutic. And any time that you combine, you know, clinical care and some science and some attorney speak and some like regulatory speak and then throw in some engineering speak, you're going to get a lot of new vocabulary and a lot of new acronyms. Um, acronyms. So as we go through, um, I'll also like hopefully be giving you a bit of a glossary of terms so that you'll get more accustomed to hearing these types of words and abbreviations and know what's meant by them when you see them again in, um, in other places. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about why digital therapeutics and what role I think they have to play in behavioral health care, and then give you some ideas about how or where you might be able to utilize them in your practices, and then end with some tips on how you can learn more about digital therapeutics in addition to being part of this uh, seminar series um, and stay up to date um, after the series ends. So what are digital therapeutics? Well, <clears throat> Most of our healthcare system um, has now become digital in many, many ways, right? And there's a lot of digital health technologies that touch our lives every day. Not all of those are digital therapeutics. So those really range from on the far left here, um, things that are created to help support the system. So maybe that is a digital means of um, registering patients to beds in hospitals or a digital means of you keeping your private practice appointment schedule. Um, then to things that are more for clinician services and support. So that's where you have like your electronic health records um, and any other kinds of health IT fall into that bucket. And then in the middle, we have the bucket that I think is probably most closely affiliated with digital therapeutics. And those are the patient facing wellness types of products. And we're going to talk a lot today about sort of those differences between a wellness product and a digital therapeutics. But wellness products are any kind of um, app that you might use um, to improve your general health or the way that you cope with things. Um, and they also might be like non-medical grade activity trackers, fitness trackers, you know, your Apple Watch or Fitbit, things like that fall into that category. We then have more diagnostic and monitoring um, applications. Um, and those are, you know, like maybe a medical grade uh, uh, step counter or um, wearable cardiac monitor, things like that. And then on the far right is where we actually come into a digital therapeutic itself. And um, digital therapeutics really being differentiated from some of these other categories in that their goal is that they are absolutely per presenting an intervention or preventative care for a disease state, right? So the definition of a digital therapeutic is that they are delivering a medical intervention directly to the patient using evidence-based clinically evaluated software to treat, manage, or prevent a spectrum of diseases or disorders, right? So unlike um, a wellness app that might be focused more on your general quality of life or helping you to cope with symptoms of something, um, these are really designed to directly treat or prevent the, the disease itself. And the other key difference is that digital therapeutics, uh, given that they are seen as something that is treating or preventing a medical condition, are held to the same standards of evidence and regulatory oversight as any other kind of traditional medical treatment. One of the key voices in this area is the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. And at the end of the presentation today, um, and in the uh, PDF that you'll get, you'll see the links as well, um, I'll give you some more information on how to contact or, get, or follow the DTA or Digital Therapeutics Alliance. But they've created these 10 foundational principles that really guide the field as we create digital therapeutics. And you'll see that these are really all about holding this field to a high level of evidence and quality and safety, um, just like we would for our pharmaceuticals. So digital therapeutics must be um, designed to prevent, manage, or treat a disorder or disease. 
They need to produce a medical intervention that's driven by software. They have to incorporate best um, practices for design, for manufacturing, for quality. Um, they encourage the end users in the product development. They engage them in product development and then usability processes. So we build our digital therapeutics together with the voice of patients. Um, they need to take patient privacy and security protections very, very seriously um, and need to be cleared by all of the, not just HIPAA standards, but the other kinds of tech standards um, in these data security uh, fields. Um, they need to apply um, best practices for how we deploy these products and manage and maintain them over time, right? So given that they're software, they may change, they may iterate over time. Um, we need to fix bugs as they come out. We need to publish um, the results of our trials, um, including how there might be clinically meaningful in peer-reviewed journals, just like you would expect for pharmaceuticals. Um, and they need to be reviewed and cleared by the regulatory agencies and regulatory bodies, not only um, to support their claims of what they treat um, and what they're intended to do, but also to support their safety claims. And um, we need to make those claims really appropriate to and in line with what we've been cleared to say um, from those regulatory bodies. And then once things are in market, we need to continue to be analyzing data, collecting real world evidence and using that for product performance, just like, you know, once even after a drug goes to market and is cleared by the FDA, they're still collecting data. And occasionally you'll hear of a, you know, a drug that's later on pulled from the market for safety concerns that didn't pop up until many years after use or things of that nature. It's really important that we continue to do that post um, post clearance data um, collection as well. So um, in the US, digital therapeutics are regulated by the FDA, just like a um, any other type of medical device or any type of pharmaceutical. Um, within the FDA, they go through the same center um, for other devices. And so that's the Center for Device and Radiological Health or the CDRH. Uh, there's also a committee um, or center within FDA that specifically looks at digital health. Um, and they don't clear devices or do the reviews of them, um, but they're there to help consult with innovators and companies like ours um, as we try to build our compliant uh, digital therapeutics. And they also do some cons consultation to the reviewers at CGRH, uh, because a lot of those are individuals who are much more accustomed to reviewing um, other kinds of medical devices or radiology devices, um, and they're newer to the field of digital. And so they help them to better understand what they're reviewing as well. Now, there's um, other terms and words that you may hear as you kind of get more involved in um, digital therapeutics and throughout the course, perhaps of this seminar series. So just to give you some sense of these things as well, when a digital therapeutic is cleared at FDA, it's either cleared to be prescription or over-the-counter, same as a, any other kind of pharmaceutical. We tend to call our prescription devices PDTs. Again, we seem to like a lot of um, acronyms, which just means a prescription digital therapeutic, um, or they might be over-the-counter. <clears throat> to date, the vast majority of um, digital therapeutics have been approved as prescription, um, though we're starting to see a little bit more movement in over-the-counter. And we do expect that over time, we'll see some um, devices hold both of those types of clearances, just like we see that sometimes for a medication. Um, and the difference might be doses, right? Like you can get ibuprofen at 200 milligrams over the counter, but if you want the 800 milligram pill, you need to get that prescription. Um, or it may just be over time, things that, you know, we collect more post-market data and see are really safe become over the counter as opposed to prescription. Prescription has been a huge issue in this field um, in terms of access to care. And so um, we've been really, really careful <clears throat> within um, DTA, within the American Psychological Association, um, and within individual companies to help FDA understand um, that a prescriber of a digital therapeutic does not necessarily need to hold the same credentials 
as a prescriber of a pharmacotherapy. So I know um, and assume from um, this the background of this group that probably many of you um, do, but many of you don't hold prescription privileges for medication, um, but would be really, really oh, more than able to prescribe a digital therapeutic, which really is developing or, or delivering a psychotherapy, not a medication. Um, so if you can provide psychotherapy, you should directly yourself, you should absolutely be able to prescribe a device that would give the psychotherapy. So we've de defined prescription much more broadly to really be any appropriate um, allied health professional um, can do that prescribing for digital therapeutics. Um, these therapeutics are also cleared either to be adjunctive to other care or standalone. And again, that just depends on how you test them in the clinical trials that go um, through FDA and what their intended use really is. So for example, in um, our product pipeline, we're developing an intervention for opioid use disorder that is really at this point just designed to be given hand in hand with a medication like um, methadone or buprenorphine. And so when we go for FDA clearance of that device, it will be as an adjunctive device for patients who are already receiving MOUD. We have another product that um, is going through FDA clearance process um, currently for social anxiety disorder. And for that, we think there's no reason that you necessarily need to be on adjunctive other kinds of treatment or medication for social anxiety disorder. This is a cognitive behavioral exposure-based intervention, um, and you can get that as a standalone. So they just have to be cleared in that, in that way, and then they can really be developed in either direction. The other language that you'll hear frequently um, in this field, um, and, and the other abbreviation is what we call either SAMD or SIMD. The vast majority of digital therapeutics are SAMD. And what that means, it stands for software as a medical device, as opposed to SIMD, which is software in a medical device. And the difference being, when you think of like what comes to mind probably most often when you think about a behavioral health digital therapeutic, you're probably thinking about an app that you might do on a smartphone. The software there is the medical device. The software is the app. The smartphone is not the device. The, that is a, you know, a phone that is readily available to the public in many other ways, has no sort of medical device clearance for it, um, and is sort of a typical off-the-shelf phone. It's just the software that's getting cleared as the medical device through FDA. SIMD means that the manufacturer of the medical device has created an actual um, hardware piece that must be used in order to run the software. And so you're, it's, you're really clearing not only the software, but the software as presented in the hardware that you've created. And I'll show you some of the examples of that later on. But you may hear those abbreviations, SAMD or SIMD. That's all that that means. Most um, digital therapeutics or SAMD. It's really just the software, but not all of them are. So this is where normally if we were all in the same room, I'd stop and ask any questions, but we'll get to them at the end. I realize I'm giving you a lot of information as we go. Um, digital therapeutics are regulated not just in the U.S., but ac across the globe, and they've been growing broadly across the globe. As a matter of fact, we actually see a lot more traction um, in parts of the EU, particularly in Germany um, and in Japan and a little bit in Australia um, than we do in the US right now. And that really has to do with the regulatory standards. So it's a pretty busy chart, um, but you'll see um, that a lot of the regulations here, you know, there's they all have a regulatory body um, like the FDA that reviews these. Um, they all kind of have different levels of regulation that are pretty similar. Um, in terms of the clinical requirements, you'll see almost every country demands that there's some rigorous clinical trial, usually an RCT or you know, randomized clinical trial that's done in order to get clearance for the device. Um, but the biggest difference, and that has to do with their uptake, is that red bar, which is, are these reimbursed currently by the government? 
And what we see is that in many parts of the EU, particularly in Germany, um, but in a number of other countries as well, there's very clear reimbursement for most digital therapeutics. So once you get that regulatory approval, um, the national government is going to pay um, patients just like they pay for other types of care um, to get the digital therapeutic. We see that a fair amount in Japan as well and a little bit in Australia. It's much more limited currently in the U.S. And that will impact their usability in their practices as well, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, and has impacted the field a fair amount too. We're starting to see a little bit more traction with reimbursement, but it's really not there yet. Um, this just gives you a sense of a little bit of a scope. Um, <clears throat> this isn't entirely um, in in inclusive of all FDA cleared um, or approved um, devices for mental and behavioral health, um, but it, it gives you a sense. There's not a ton yet in this field, um, but there is coverage of you know anxiety and depression, attention um, deficits and ADD, uh, sleep problems and insomnia, chronic pain, and substance use. Um, some of these, and, and the difference here between the improved and enforcement discretion, you'll see that sometimes as well in the labeling of the of some of these devices. Enforcement discretion was during the um, COVID public health emergency, the FDA said, like, we need more treatments uh, for mental and behavioral health, even though we don't have all the data we need yet. We have enough preliminary data that about the safety of these devices that we feel comfortable going ahead and saying, you can use them now, you can market and sell them now while you collect more efficacy data on them because we believe that they're safe. And so some of these devices only have enforcement discretion, whereas the ones that are approved have been through the full RCT and are fully cleared and approved. Um, some of these you'll see like at the bottom, these substance use um, for reset and reset O, and then Somerist for insomnia came from a company called Pear. Um, those of you who've been following this field may know a little bit about Pear Therapeutics. They really were a leader in digital therapeutics um, and had the most, they had bought most into the idea that all of these things need to be FDA cleared. They spent a lot of time and money getting their devices cleared. Um, and then because reimbursement didn't catch up yet for those clear devices, they wound up declaring bankruptcy within 2023. And unfortunately, these products are not on the market right now or available to patients, um, though they're working really hard to find ways to make them available again um, through other companies purchasing some of that um, the software and working to kind of get them back out into uh, public use. But there's been a lot of turmoil in the field. Um, in part because reimbursement has been slow to come. Um, the other thing to know about digital therapeutics, I think, you know, for a lot of us, when we think about them, we think really of like that bottom corner where Sleepio is, where it's like, it's an app on your phone and it's an app that delivers cognitive behavioral therapy by kind of reading and watching videos and clicking through and, and kind of reading and learning about things to do. And maybe it assigns you something to go do out in the world, like, you know, a sleepio it's for, for insomnia, it, you know, it may insign, uh, give you information about um, sleep restriction and then assigns you a little homework of like how to do that that night at home. But there's lots of different modalities for how digital therapeutics are presented. Um, so Endeavor RX um, is a therapeutic for um, children with uh, attention deficit disorder, and it is a video game um, that's played on a tablet that um, that helps train attention. Uh, Free Spira is a product for panic attacks. And it actually has like a nasal cannula that measures your breathing and then a little biofeedback device um, to um, help to learn to regulate your breath during a panic and help pre prevent panics. Um, the um, NeuroVivo is for um, chronic migraine and is a little uh, sensor that you wear in your arm that provides neuromodulation. Um, and then at the bottom here, you'll see reliever um, Rx, which is one of our competitors, actually, and one of our products, Game Change. Um, we mostly um, develop our products in um, virtual reality. It's part of why we're called Realized Care. Um, and so you're actually playing up through a full product um, in a virtual environment. Um, and sometimes these feel like games or challenges or things for you to do um, in VR, in a VR headset. Um, interestingly, um, 
to relate to the conversation we had before, the company that makes Reliever um, is a, it developed Reliever as Sam as uh, SIMD. So they make their own proprietary headset, and you have to purchase or rent their headset with their product in it. Whereas we we do our products as SAMD, so they run off of a regular like MetaQuest headset that like anyone can buy, um, and it's just the software. So lots of different modalities and different ways um, to present a digital therapy that they're not always just an app. So why digital therapeutics? What role do these have to play in behavioral health care? Um, most of you are providers in the space. You know um, this story. It's about the demand, right? So we all know we have a mental health crisis currently. We have one growing way before the pandemic, but the pandemic, as we know, definitely made it worse and brought a huge increase in um, reported cases of depression, anxiety, um, and in um, overdose deaths as well. And we also know we have proven, proven treatments. Um, the American Psychological Association now lists over 85 specific different empirically supported psychotherapies. Um, so there are psychotherapies that work for these conditions, but the problem is um, most people don't get them. Most people don't get their pharmacotherapies either. Um, and um, we believe that digital therapeutics are a way to increase that access and are really an important um, way to, to do that. And maybe one of the only ways to really increase access to meet the scale of need. Um, and part of that is because we know we have such a huge provider shortage. Again, we had a provider shortage prior to the pandemic, but we all know that there have been mass ex exodus from healthcare and it's made things worse. So in terms of general health providers, so people to, you know, primary care and general health um, providers actually do the bulk of um, behavioral health care um, before patients make it into tertiary care. Um, and we have um, over 500,000 nurses expected to exit the workforce. Um, and it's been predicted that um, within 10 years, we're going to have a physician shortage of more than 100,000 in order to meet the need of our population. And um, that exodus has been true for mental health providers as well. Um, and that imbalance in supply and demand has been there for quite some time. So this is data um, on the bottom left corner there that came, this was predicted in 2015. So this was before anyone even thought about the pandemic. It was predicted that by 2025, we would have a shortage of almost 100,000 um, individuals who can provide psychotherapy. And the pandemic has just made that worse. Um, currently, 65% of U.S. psychologists now report that they don't have any ability to take on any new patients at all. And um, most of you um, who are in the field um, probably um, are living this every day, wait lists that are way too long, um, burden to take on new patients because it feels like there's no way to say no to families and to patients who have um, urgent care and emergency needs. Uh, patients um, post-suicidal who are staying in the hospital because there's no discharge plan for them because there's no outpatient care available or inpatient care available for them um, other than like medical um, inpatient where they are now um, and just even like friends and family, right? So um, I, I don't think there's anyone in this field um, who in the past few years has an, on a regular basis had friends, family, neighbors, um, people I meet at the supermarket who know I'm a psychologist ask me, hey, can you help me get um, this person in my life into psychotherapy? Can you help me find a therapist for them? And even being super connected in my area, it, it's often almost impossible, especially if I want someone who's gonna be affordable and take their insurance. Um, so, we know this is leading um, to a situation right now where 64% um, of individuals in the U.S. Um, who have a mental health or substance use problem aren't getting any treatment at all. Um, and on the right side, this was some data from um, my previous work at Brown, again, pre-pandemic, where we looked at individuals um, across uh, numerous primary care sites in New England who had um, anxiety disorders and looked at were they getting any treatment, and if they were, were they getting treatment that seemed adequate? Um, and only 14% of those patients were getting psychotherapy that had any of the components 
um, of evidence-based treatments for anxiety disorders. So that like did any kind of cognitive work or any kind of exposure therapy, or even like just having people get psychoeducation about what anxiety is. So very low rates of adequate care. So there have been other attempts to try to address treatment access. Um, one idea was, okay, we just need to train more therapists. <clears throat> and um, the Biden administration built into the 2023 budget $700 million to train new mental health and substance use providers. Amazing. Um, and none of those people are yet practicing today, right? Because you can't learn how to do this and get credentialed to do it in a year. Um, and it's going to be many, many years before we start to see the impact of that um, that money flowing in. And we also know seven hundred million dollars sounds like huge, huge money. But when you think about training costs and kind of spread that out across all the states of our nation, um, it's not going to go that far. So there have also been a huge number of companies that have popped up mostly during the pandemic um, and since to increase access to telehealth. And these are companies that. Um, fall in kind of that like digital health and digital mental health umbrella, but they're not digital therapeutics. What they are are companies that provide a platform that helps uh, patients either directly like better help or talk space or indirectly like through your employer or through your healthcare system like Lyra or Bicycle Health um, to find a therapist um, and, and some of these also a psychiatrist um, that will meet with you via the telehealth platform. So these are great in that like, uh, it's hard to figure out how you even find a therapist or a psychiatrist otherwise. Now you can kind of download this app and find one right through that. Um, so definitely helps increase access that way. The downsides are what they don't do is help you to, um, in the long term, increase the supply and demand issue, right? Because you still need licensed providers one-to-one -one with each one of these patients who is reaching out. So eventually, like we're, these sites are still going to not be able to scale up high enough to meet the full demand, and they're not going to cover the full demand of everyone who needs a therapist. Um, and there's also some quality control issues as well with many of these sites in that in order to keep, like there's high turnover um, and um, hard to keep therapists involved in us because in order to make the business model work, some of these sites only reimburse their therapists at about $40 an hour. Um, some are even lower. Um, better help right now if you're maritized over the course of a year. Um, the last date I saw us, it was about 17 to $18 an hour. So they have a really hard time holding on to good therapists. Um, the other um, piece on the spectrum is these general wellness apps that we talked about a fair amount um, early on, right? So these are things like the Calm app, um, Wobot Health, which is a really cool AI um, chatbot for mental health, um, Spark Direct, which is um, downloadable, you know, on your phone from your app store um, to help adolescents better cope with symptoms of depression. Um, one of our products here, Fern, which is um, also downloadable to help people with chronic manage chronic pain. Um, and these are great um, as you know, sort of a first step in order to help you kind of treat some of your or address some of your symptoms, um, help you cope well with the symptoms. So really not designed as treatment. And they have not been, by the very nature that they're wellness apps, reviewed by FDA. And they've not been cleared um, as being, you know, th there often are not clear um, randomized control trials that show their efficacy. So as a provider, when you refer or recommend a patient maybe downloads one of these, um, it's kind of left on you to check out the program and to see if you think it's delivering good care. You're not going to find typically like a wealth of good data um, easily available on that. And you're definitely not going to have that sort of like FDA stamp of approval. Yep, this is FDA cleared shortcut for, I know it's safe and I know it's effective. So that's why we think digital therapeutics matter, right? They're a really efficient workforce multiplier. Um, 
able to really expand who can get seen um, with good quality treatment because you can just download something or put on your headset or put on your nasal cannula. You don't need um, a one-on-one -on -one with a provider. And they're convenient and accessible, private, just like your digital, like mental health wellness apps, right? Something you can do on your own in the privacy of your own home, um, reduces stigma, um, and maybe increases access to populations of patients that wouldn't feel comfortable going for therapy um, or that had no idea how else to access it. Um, enables us potentially to also do a lot of work in what we like to call tech with um, So like health tech equity, make these prices a little more affordable sometimes um, over time for, um, for patient use, um, as opposed to, I know in my state, I live in Massachusetts, most um, therapists in my area don't take any insurance at all anymore. They're all private pay and they're charging like $350 a session. That is affordable to almost no one. Um, so digital has the ability to bring that down as well, hopefully. Um, and then, you know, you're getting a controlled, scientific, validated content, you know, which again, some of these other things, you don't really know that whether that's an app that hasn't been tested in the same way or even more so when it's a human therapist. Um, a human therapist, we know that that therapist has been credentialed and they've made it through their schooling and they've made it through some kind of credentialing exam, but we don't necessarily know what they're doing in session with their patients um, and whether or not they're using any like evidence-based treatments at that time. So how does this impact you? How can you potentially utilize it, DTX, with your patients? I think there's a broad number of different potential uses. Um, and these may differ a little bit too, whether you're like running a whole practice, um, or running a whole hospital site, or if you have a private practice, um, and whether you're a behavioral health provider or more of a primary care general health provider, um, or even like a rheumatologist or a um, anesthesiologist and have, you know, patient or cardiologists have patients have a lot of overlap with um, behavioral health problems. So one option um, is that we've seen implemented a lot is that um, it helps with weight list reduction, right? So if you've got a long wait list of patients waiting to see you or waiting to see another behavioral health provider, a digital therapeutic can be prescribed um, or recommended for those patients that they could start getting some treatment earlier on before they can make it into treatment. Also helps you retain people who may be on your wait list who maybe otherwise would have gone and found a different healthcare system or a different provider because they didn't want to wait. Here's there something you can give them right away. Um, if you're actually delivering uh, psychotherapy yourself, uh, we see some people do it adjunctively with a digital therapeutic as sort of a between session homework. Um, so this is something that, you know, if you're treating someone for panic attacks, for example, you could say, okay, in between sessions, I want you to use that free Spira app every day. Um, and let's see how it's going. And we'll check back in on it each week. Um, for some more exposure-based or cognitive behavioral-based interventions, you might be doing CBT in session. And this is a way that, to keep somebody's mind fresh, help them keep learning some of this, do some of the exposure practices. Another possibility is for maintenance. Um, so you give your patients a course of treatment. Now they've either run out um, of coverage on their insurance of how many sessions they get with you or um, for you know, the scope of your practice um, in, within your system. Maybe you can only give people so many sessions before you need to um, have people um, cycle through it so you can get more on the wait list. Um, it's a great way of maintaining their gains. It's like, okay, we've worked with you um, in session on these um, types of problems. Take this app, take this product, take this digital therapeutic and continue to use it to practice what you've learned here. All of these things hopefully serve as a means for you to serve more patients in your program to serve more patients each week. Um, and so, you know, potentially, um, even for people on your wait list, you could start to think of this more like the way um, that an MD, a psychiatrist might do med checks, right? So instead of telling patients on maintenance or on a wait list um, that like we can't do anything for them right now, you might be able to get more patients in, 
bill them for very short, um, you know, every two weeks, every three weeks, 15, 20 minute, 30 minute sessions where you're kind of just doing almost like a med check on how's it going in the digital therapeutic um, as they go through. And so enabling you to see more patients and bill for more patients and care for and treat more patients over time than if everyone just had to get your full 50 minute psychotherapy session. Um, additionally, like these are often utilized as adjunctive treatment for non psychotherapy providers too, right? So like if you're a psychiatrist and you can't get your patients into psychotherapy, um, if you're an endocrinologist and you've got patients with diabetes who also need some diabetic, um, behavioral health and lifestyle changes, um, and you can't get them in to see a behavioral health specialist, this is a really great adjunctive to uh, adjunct to the treatment you're already doing. And then potentially they're just standalone behavioral health treatments as well um, for patients that you want to refer to behavioral health and they can't get any other care. But there are pain points um, to their implementation. Um, and these affect you from the clinical cl clinician side and the provider side. They impact us um, <clears throat> from the um, developer side as well. Um, and so everyone's working on these pain points, but they still definitely exist. So I'll go through these a bit as, um, you know, more specifically, but these are some of the main pain points that we see when we try to implement digital therapeutics. So the first is clinician familiarity with the device. Um, you guys are experts on health and behavioral health, um, and you know what you're prescribing really well, or you know the treatments you're doing really well. Um, no one wants to give a, their patient something that they don't fully understand. Um, and certainly like if there's med checks or check like device check visits and checking in on it, which we recommend, um, nobody wants to be like, I don't even know what to ask because I don't know what this device is. And so sometimes that can be a piece that feels daunting, particularly if the device is more complicated than just a phone app. Like if it's, you know, the cannula up your nose or if it's a VR headset and a program in VR. Um, the good news is that pretty much all DTX companies will very easily provide you with um, demos of the products, with training. They'll provide you with ongoing customer support that your patients can call into directly. They don't necessarily have to go through you to ask all those questions, but that also you could call into if you have questions and really, almost all of these are designed to be extremely easy to understand and simple to use. So it tends to be, we see this as a pain point to initiation, like to the very first time you're going to start a DTX um, within a clinic or within a provider organization. People are like, oh, I don't want to learn something new. Um, but that once you get in um, to it, it becomes really not a barrier uh, um, over time at all. <clears throat> and most of our trainings, so like we provide treatment in VR headsets. Um, we um, have found that we can fully train you um, within an hour done. Um, some, some sites for people um, who understand what the therapeutic is a little bit better, it's as much it's as little as 30 minutes. So it's not a lot of time out of clinical practice to learn how to use these. Um, the other huge um, pain point has to do with workflow in integration. Um, so most of these need to be either prescribed or at least ordered or recommended, right? Because you're getting this from the company. And right now, most of the existing digital therapeutics do not have integration with your workflow. So like these are examples, screenshots from like the Freespira website and the Endeavor website on, that you would log into as a provider to see how you're going to get your patient this. And you'll see it's like, they're trying to make it easy, but you have to go to their website, get out of like your EHR and what, what else you're doing, log on to their website and then complete a form um, or get into a portal and complete the form there or make a phone call and register your patient for this device. And then the company is going to follow up with the patient after that to ship them the device or to make it av them available to download the app. So it's not a seamless process. It's not super hard, um, but we know like when you're in your EHR all day and you've got a busy workflow, um, anytime you've got to click out of that and onto something else, it can be a little bit of a pain point. Um, similar with outcome reports and feedback. So 
we see um, some digital therapeutics that become another sort of black box where you're prescribing this for your patient and recommending a patient gets it. And then the only way you hear how, it, how they're doing with it is from their self-report. Um, the better um, solutions are really working to integrate with your existing EHRs and workflow. So not only make ordering and prescribing simple so you can do it right through the EHR, but that you're getting feedback immediately in the EHR reports generated um, or even a note generated if you want that says like hey your patient you know this week your patient did these two sessions um, and this is what they were about so just like brief reports and brief notes that you can quickly um, see in your EHR I think that's what the whole field is working towards honestly not that many um, digital therapeutics have yet achieved this um, but more and more are getting closer and closer to this um, the other pain point is reimbursement, as I just talked about earlier. So currently, um, there is a bill um, before Congress um, to increase access. It would make it um, a law that if a digital therapeutic had FDA clearance, um, Medicaid and Medicare would have to cover it. Um, but this was introduced in 2022 and then reintroduced in 2023, and it's still kind of sitting on the Committee on Finance. It is not moving quickly. It's not a huge priority right now, even though it has bipartisan support. I doubt in an election year, this is going to register to be a huge priority either. And so it's going to be a little while probably before reimbursement comes. Um, so how else are these things paid for? Some individual um, Insurance providers do cover a range of digital therapeutics. Highmark, for example, covers um, more than many others, um, but CVS Caremark is moving into this area and more PNBs are starting to cover them. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield covers a number of them as well in different states, not in all states. Uh, but there are also other models of payment, which I'm not going to go into in too much detail. You have other sessions coming up on regulation and payment, but other things that you can be doing um, at, to get reimbursed. We talked a little bit about, you know, patients potentially paying out of pocket for some of this. Um, some of these are not very expensive. Um, and then you re recouping money by doing these um, small and billing for these short, like med check, but device check appointments. Um, some of these that are SIMD in the device are being billed through DME, which is durable medical equipment billing. Um, and we're also seeing new codes for remote remote therapy monitoring being billed for digital therapeutics and um, chronic care management being billed for digital therapeutics. And um, you can read more and we can talk more about that at another point um, if you're interested. And I think you have some sessions coming up that may go into this further. Um, so why do this for your practice? Um, again, it may help you manage your wait list and retain patients. Um, you might be able to treat and therefore bill for more patients. Um, it also just may help you attract patients in that you're offering cutting edge technology. Um, we're building in VR and we know that like that has been for the, some of the clinics that we've deployed and kind of a thing that they like to promote um, and when they promote their center and their clinic because it just sounds really innovative and cutting edge. Um, we've also found providers. Others really like doing it. Um, also feel like they are staying at the tip of their game and offering cutting edge treatment. So helping to retain providers um, may keep people engaged and prevent dropout between sessions because they're continuing to practice something. Um, and most importantly, we believe these things are gonna help drive outcomes, which is again, what most of us really do care about, right? Is getting those patients better. Um, so in summary, they, we believe that these really offer the opportunity um, to expand access to not just care, but to care that's really proven to be highly effective um, for mental and behavioral health problems um, and to help you extend your practices. Um, there are newly cleared digital therapeutics that become available each year. Um, and there's a variety of different um, reimbursement models right now, but the likelihood of more coverage coming. And then I just included, so you can have this on your notes, um, a bunch of different ways that you can stay involved. There's a, a number of different organizations to follow um, that are um, really the leaders in this area, um, as well as Therapists in Tech is like a Slack channel that you can like get more information from, publication, um, JIMR is like the publication that publishes most of these clinical trials. And then CBITS is a center that actually can provide you with more um, training in CME, um, specifically in behavioral technologies, um, if that's something you're interested in pursuing more in the future. So thank you.
Okay. It looks like we have just one question in the Q&A. Do any telehealth providers use Medicaid insurance? Um, yeah, I do think, um, I know less about the um, kind of telehealth, teledoc um, providers than I do about the digital therapeutics companies um, um, for sure. But I do believe that some of them um, may provide that coverage. Um, there are some that are uh, like bicycle health, I think might, um, which is specifically for opioid use disorder. And I think to get into bicycle health, like you need um, like to be referred from from a provider. Like I don't think a patient can go in on their own. I'm not sure. Um, and so those are more likely to take that kind of insurance. A lot of them are private pay, um, like better help and things like that, where you're paying where you're paying out of the pocket. So they try to keep those rates low, but that's part of why they then pay their providers not so well. So that's kind of the balance. Any other, Any other questions other? from our audience? Yeah, we're getting a lot of in the chat uh, just saying thank you for your knowledge and, and spending your time with us. Uh, very eye-opening. Good presentation. So much presented within one hour. Yes, so much information. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, it's just a lot to take in. I know this is the first one of, of our series. Uh, but Dr. Dr. Risa did say that we will be able to share her PowerPoint. So we have that and we'll be emailing that to everybody as a PDF uh, later. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Um, okay, so we do have one more question in the chat. Is anyone trying to get digital help using insurances like Medicaid? Yes. I mean, that's been a huge push, right? So like, um, that is what the, um, what this bill before Congress is specifically about. Like it would, it would require Medicaid, um, like not just in the state, but like it'd be a federal requirement for all Medicaid, Medicare, um, to cover, um, federal FDA approved digital therapeutics. Um, so there are digital therapeutics companies that, um, while waiting for that bill to get passed because it's taking forever are going to their state providers and saying, hey, here's all of our data. Here's all of our evidence. We're FDA cleared. Will you provide coverage for the individuals in your state plans? And there's been some traction there. Um, interesting, pair therapeutics for their opioid use um, disorder product had most traction there. They had a lot of the blues and a lot of the Medicaid's and Medicare's covering um, and unfortunately, it just wasn't enough fast enough for the amount of money they spent on their clinical trials. It, it's been a huge issue in our field in that, you know, when we think about clinical trials, we typically think about, like for FDA, we think about huge drug companies like, you know, Pfizer or um, GSK mounting these large trials, and they've got huge deep pockets um, to do those. Um, so those things are super expensive. Most digital therapeutic companies um, are small startups. And so um, it's been this balance, I think, of trying not to bankrupt the company while waiting for reimbursement to come. So if there's one more. Oh. Thank you that. for answering that. Awesome presentation, so much great information. Everyone's just singing uh, your, your praises. Uh, so um, one more, are you saying that the state agencies will offer telehealth but would warrant waiting list as as well. They do not hire enough people. That is in the Q and A. Oh, um, you know, I think it really is dependent on um, you know, state to state and agency to agency. Um, but yeah, there are there are some um states where. Um, the ratio of available providers, even in state agencies, is so low um, that they do have waiting lists even for their tele telehealth. Like they're just not able to to see all their patients who um, who are um, eligible uh, for the care, and so people do wind up on wait lists. I I came from prior to um, my more current jobs. I was at the VA for um, about seven years. And, you know, nationally at the VA waitlist, as you probably all know, was a huge issue. Um, and so same day access was like a requirement um, for veterans. Um, but even there um, across different VAs, what most people were able to do was like we could see a patient initially um, for same day access. 
um, and then triage based on how emergent it was, but you might still wind up on the wait list after you got that same day access or, we call, or like your next appointment might be like a month from now when, when something opened up. Um, so it, that's definitely still happening at, at some um, at some governmental agencies, um, whether they be state or federal. There's just not enough providers. Yeah. So I realized I presented a lot of information today. It was a lot to take in. I hope the slides will help when you get them. But also, like, I hope what I did, my goal was to get you enough familiarity with, like, the general scope and some of these terms and acronyms and, like, the context behind all this, that when you go into the rest of the webinar series and people are, like, then focusing in on specifics of it, it'll all kind of make more sense and you'll have this general context to piece it into. So that, that was my goal for you today. So don't worry if it was too much to take in. I'm sure um, Ashley and Karen, the team have built up like a bunch of pieces of the rest of the webinar series that will um, build on this and, and double click on some of the pieces that um, were harder to grasp today. Well, thank you so much uh, for giving us that overview. We'll be diving in in the next five months to the, the other five webinars, but we appreciate you giving your time and expertise to us. And as always, um, info at Foundation for Wellness. We will be emailing the certificate information from that email. If you have any other questions about this webinar or upcoming webinars, you can always reach us at info at Foundation for Wellness. We'll be happy to connect with you there. Thank you so much, Dr. Risa Weisberg. We appreciate you spending your, your time with us. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. And Ashley, if you like, when you send out the PDF, feel free to send out my email as well. I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions later on too. At, um, it's just my name, Risa Weisberg at realizedcare.com. I'm happy to reach out for anyone who reaches out. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing that. We'll include that in that information. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic. Take care, folks.